So the National Museum of Computing, um, the part where EDSAC is located, is the original Block H and has a wartime roof which is now quite old and decayed. And so with funding from the local authority, our, our landlord, the Bletchley Park Trust, is replacing that section of roof. And it means the galleries underneath are going to be shut probably until the early spring. We've therefore had to stop work on the machine. We've had to cover it with a, a frame and a plastic sheeting so that um, nothing can fall through from the roof works and, and damage the machine. In some ways that's brought the project to a halt. In another way it's an opportunity to gather our breath and sort out a number of things um, that have been waiting to be done while we've been busy commissioning. And so again January, February might be a good time to do a bit of writing and revising of some of the, the documents and pulling them into a more coherent set of reports. So some people are updating documentation, some people are planning for the, the next stage of the work. In other areas and um, we can get some access to the machine so we've been taking chassis away to rework circuits that we know have been problematic um, and we're meeting today to review what's going on to plan for the restart. Okay, so what did I put first on the list? Um, yep, main control where things are happening. So, James, you and your team, do you want to catch us up to where you got to? One afternoon when Tony, Tom and I were testing, suddenly uh, we saw on the oscilloscope that the machine appeared to be continuing running by itself which was hugely exciting and um, it ran for two or three minutes and stopped. We went on to fix some other issues and then we had a run which lasted for about half an hour which we <coughs> felt probably meant the machine had executed its first million instructions. Tell me what bits of the machine are talking to what other bits and well, I mean what's actually <coughs> working? What's actually working is the, well the MCU is actually working, that's what Tony's been working on. The O1 chassis are now working, the addressing to the O1 chassis are sort of working. I've just uh, implemented the initial order system which is, comprises the unit selector and two, and two chassis that I'm going to report on this afternoon. That's well ahead and hopefully we're ready just to install that and make it, make it all work. So yeah, it's looking good. But the delay lines are still not functioning, you're using emulators? No, the delay lines are working. Oh, they are working? Oh, they are working, yes. Um, well, we, have, we haven't used them with EDSAC yet, have we? Well, I think, yeah, but don't forget. They've been used. What we're concerned about is not that. The, all, all, the, um, all the work on the delay lines have been with the interfaces, the O1s, mm -hmm. and the addressing to that. So that actually does work. What you're talking about is actually talking to the, the to the ad the addressing interface itself. Mm -hmm. So that certainly has not been proved yet. But we're very happy to be using the simulation of the delay lines for the moment. What we have found is that the signals coming from tank zero, where we're putting our program in, are too delayed through the main main output bus to again to catch up with the clock. And this is the thing we've gone through in uh, uh, James's report about how we've got the MCU now working by removing the odd amplifier to reduce the delay and improving the sensitivity of the chassis O1s. And that was the big break we made just before the shutdown that enabled us to have a 42 minute run of admittedly a single instruction located at position zero in tank zero you were loading an instruction and was it executing the instruction? And it was executing that instruction which meant it sent a signal over to the arithmetic logic unit which was then acted on and two, two cycles later um, uh, was I've completed that an end signal came back which kicked off the next phase so that was running for best part of 40 minutes. Um, what we have to do next is to make sure that the uh, part of the circuit which increments the address works. So we then move on to address one, address two, and then the counter and the coincidence unit have to recognize that we're at that place in the store, 
pull out that instruction, send it over the main output bus so that we can do it. Now, so at the moment, we've been hardwired to position zero, and that has been difficult enough. So, uh, you know, we have many, many stages to get to, but we, we believe, you know, we're on an, a, an upward curve at the moment where we're accelerating in our rate of commissioning. And now as more of the machine is working and we're getting to understand some of the operational issues of keeping it running, there's a discussion of how it will be run when we have demonstrations, how qualified the demonstrators will have to be, and how we'll go about diagnosing the inevitable faults that will arise when components fail in the operating machine. Central to any computer is a time system, a central source of clock pulses, uh, which are provided on this machine by this chassis here, which provides clock pulses at uh, roughly half a million per second. Uh, the chassis we're now looking at are the... A current problem hampering the integration work is that the clock seems unstable. It's frequency changing as the machine warms up and it's difficult to adjust. One thing I would point out, there seems to be a real issue with adjustment yeah. and I think we should try to introduce additional screening and some other method of tweaking the clock because I've seen people fiddling with it, especially Peter. It's a bit of a nightmare because his body capacitance actually changes the frequency itself so it tends to be a very... If you're within two feet of it, it changes. Yeah, right. So, so something we could actually look at. Yeah, it is, yes. Yeah, so the intrusion... I've got a slide presentation later, which will help with all that. At today's meeting, Tony's suggestion for stabilising the clock frequency raised an important point of principle. And bearing in mind that this has to work here at TNMOC, where there won't be a man in a white coat tweaking the knob all the while, I think it's essential to actually synchronise the clock. And here's a simple idea I've got on the board. It's um, an SI5351 triple output I squared C driven synthesizer. Now the whole thing, I'm not trying to chain, ch um, uh, replace the EDSAT clock with another clock. All I'm suggesting is that we have a very small capacitor putting in pulses into the LC tuned circuit, which synchronizes it. And it, it, it immediately avoids having to have the guy in the white coat, the official EDSAC white coat, um, turning the knob and having hand capacitance problems. And I would say this is what we need for the future to make EDSAC re reliable here at TNMOC. Shoot me down in flames if you want to. Yeah. This is completely against the spirit of the machine. <laughs> well, is the spirit of the machine not to work? Is the spirit of the machine not to be running most of the time? It does work. It does work. Yeah, but it had a staff of 12 full-time staff. No, it didn't. So, most, most of the days of the week during office hours, it had two women running it. Well, were, were they trained to turn the knob? Yes. No, yes. Right, okay. We're showing people how it was used in its day. And part of its use in the day was before your program run, you looked at the clock monitor. Now, if we've got a problem that um, when you've turned the machine on for the next three hours, our, our clock is drifting all over the place, that's going to make demos infeasible. If it's the machine settles down in 10 or 15 minutes and you dial it in, then the operating instructions in 15 minutes before you want to start doing demos, turn the machine on. If people are saying that clock drift is a real nuisance, then I'm happy as a short term thing to have a full sync device. And if it turns out in practice the warming up period is inconveniently long, like more than 15 minutes, again I'd be prepared to contemplate having a full sync device to make that work. Um, so we might not want to completely bin this. We may need it as a debugging aid. It may have an operational thing. But I think first base is if we've got the clock pace monitor, clock pulse monitor, by the time we're back up and running again, and getting the picture on that right, twiddling the knob, gives us a stable enough clock, then we're home and dry. If that turns out to be not good enough for debugging purposes, then I'm happy as an interim thing to force the clock. So it's quite a useful discussion we've just had in terms of 
men in white coats operating a knob which has a certain uh, hand capacitance sensitivity as opposed to a, a modern bit of electronics which keeps it running sweetly but you know it's about so it's authenticity versus reliability exactly it is indeed that Authent that's a nice phrase authenticity versus reliability yes indeed